<laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to speak to you about basically the, uh, the Butler Rock House, um, and, but I'm going to give you some history and some um, information that may or may not be new to you, and I hope you enjoy it, and don't hesitate to ask questions, um, but I prefer if you wait a little, you know, after it's done. So I'm just going to go on and see if I can figure this out, how we do this. <coughs> So, <clears throat> a little history is that the Hollywood Beach Hotel, which was one of Joseph Young, who's your founder of the city, the Dream City, was uh, built by him, and that's what really um, Mr. Butler, Ben Butler, came to Hollywood to work on the Hollywood Beach Hotel. Um, Mr. Joseph Young had acquired about one square mile of area uh, land, mainly through tax certificates certificates, you know, people who couldn't pay their taxes, so he bought the house, built a land for on that basis. And Ben Butler did basically did the same thing. So eventually uh, he acquired quite a bit of land and he wanted to build his, <coughs> as I said, his dream city. But Ben Butler, over time, decided he wanted to be a farmer rather than a, you know, working on construction. So by the mid-1950s, Broward County became one of the most highly noted dairy farm area in, the, in, in Florida. And it, it said that it had 25,000 dairy cattle and became a very important uh, employer of, of people in this area. And of course, as you know, Jay Ann MacArthur, who has the MacArthur milk and whatever, he was supposed to have included, he was the largest, can't spell, individually owned herd of dairy cattle, not in the state or in the, in the country, but in the world, so they said. And uh, he, he, his main market is in Miami, and this is where he processes his milk. And Butler's, Mr. Butler, he, that's where he delivered his milk to, mainly through in, in the Miami area. So, um, but in the 19, by the 1950s, if you can see, See, how do I do this? You can see that if this is 441. Most of the large farms were west of 441. These are just a few. And the, and the sizes aren't really to scale or anything. I just wanted to show you that MacArthur had the largest farm and the others were so on. So, um, and then in between here, there's farmland as well. But in the 50s, things are beginning to develop. But there you can see Ben Butler's farm, which was right in here. It was really close to downtown Hollywood by comparison. And they started with Jersey cows. That was uh, a very important uh, milk, uh, you know, easy uh, cattle that were very proficient in providing fresh milk. So. But let's go back a little bit more. Now, this photo, this area was taken in 1940. But what it shows you is the geography of that area. It's called the Tree Island, which was part of the Atlantic Coastal Ridge. And so this main Tree Island is high ground. You can see it's de demarcated by the red line. And that's the railroad tracks. Remember, this is 1940 aerial. And then this called Traverse Glades. This is um, over both sides. That's all wetlands. And so when the water, when you would drain, it would drain east, uh, eastward to the coast and westward uh, to the um, uh, Everglades. And you can see it has, it's, it's quite prominent. And it's called a tree island. Now, this is interesting. Ben Butler, he moved, he bought this little house. It was a 1925 house. And he moved it from, and if you notice, I have two places mar uh, marked, and, and there's a reason for that. All the documentation I found said that it was moved from Cleveland Street to Taft. But when I had a conversation with the daughter-in-law, she indicated that she was pretty, thought it was, came from Garfield Street. So... That's a mystery, so maybe you can figure it out, which one was which. So she couldn't, you know, she didn't have any documentation. This is what she heard, this is what she knew, and then what I read. So I put, I put it in the report as a documented from Cleveland Street. 
when I wrote the uh, designation report. So he moved the house from one of those places to out there on Taft Street, just what is now just west of I-95. Now let's go back to the island. 1947, that's part of that tree island, as you can see. It has the CSX line and the train station. And there's Bud, uh, Ben Butler's house right there. It's all marked right there. And then you see um, his milking barn. And to the right now, you can see those areas are farmland. This is back in the 40s, and mostly it was, it was agriculture. Whether it was, uh, they, the way it's lined up and everything, it, look, it appears to be vet, you know, vegetables and that kind of thing. Because I know that they grew tomatoes and whatever. Okay, back to the island again. This is moving forward. 22 years later, 1969. There's the historic tree islands, you can see. And also now, Ben Butler, whose house is right here, he also began, uh, started the Okemo Trailer Park. And what he did, he, he enticed the people there because of the beautiful live oak ha hammock. And that tree island gave birth to what we have there is the beautiful live oak that are there today, or at least some of them are still left. And some of them are over 100 years old or more. And so uh, he, he, he was a farmer, but he also had this little uh, park, 182 trailers. And then the train station was designed by a well-known architect, Gustav Moss. Uh, he was with Harvey and Clark, uh, architects in West Palm Beach. Oh, wait a minute. How do I do that? Okay. Why is um, Let's see. Sorry. Ah. So, Mr. Butler moved that little house from either Cleveland or Garfield, we don't know for sure, but he moved it over to Taft Street. And when he did this, he enlarged the house. He, the new, you can see the clip gable there at the, at the front area here, right there. He enlarged the house, making uh, the living room larger, and then he had a bathroom and, uh, that he built on, and he made some other, uh, added another room uh, on the west side, which is probably a bedroom. And uh, he reoriented the house. The house used to face uh, the back door is now the front entrance and the uh, fireplace is on the west facade where it used to be on the east facade when, they, when he moved it. So he turned the house around and, and this is how he reoriented the house based on the, the hammock in the street. So if you look at these trees here, these are live oaks, and uh, whether or not they were transplanted from when they moved the house there or they were uh, added, you know, new, new, new houses, we're, we're not sure, but you can see, clearly see that they were newly planted there. And so um, what he did was he expanded the house. The new construction was built of the rock. The middle, the existing wood frame structure was encased with the same rock. And, and then he enclosed, it had a screen in porch and he enclosed that also with the rock and in case the um, fire, exterior fireplace as well. And so this is sort of what it looks like today. Hopefully it's going to look like that for a while only it needs to be it's refurbished a little bit I think. So the Butler House Rock House was named known as the Okemo Rock House based on the trailer park. Okemo meaning nice people and so on. It's also known as the Coral Rock House. It's also known as the Rock House. And then now it's known as the Butler Rock House. So we're going to talk about that little, a, a little bit. And it's a, a broad example of the late 19th and um, early 20th century American movement of the craftsman bungaloid style. What isn't that setting beautiful? So let's talk about the rock. Okay, so you hear coral rock. The house is coral rock, right? All these houses around here, supposedly many say, well, my house is a coral rock. But let's talk about that. When, first of all, coral reefs, which is where these coral facades come from, are live coral 
reefs, and they are typically at least a mile, a mile more offshore. And, and, and theoretically, for every mile that you go out, you drop 100 feet, so from the, from the main, you know, from the at grade. So it goes down. So you're, now you're talking 100 feet to mine the coral rock underwater, 100 feet underwater. And then you talk about transporting the labor costs and this and that. Does it really make sense that these small, modest houses would be made of coral rock? But additionally, if you have real coral rock, you see the skeletons of what was a live coral. You do cross sections. When you quarry it, you know, you mine it, you, do, you cut it, and you get cross sections. So up here, you have the fan coral. Here you have the soft coral. Here you have the brain coral. So unless you see those skeletons in the rock, it's likely not coral rock. Another claim is the house is made of coquina. Now, coquina means cockle or selfish. And um, it's made up of uh, lots of shells and uh, with diff different chemistry. So with the chemistry, it, uh, which really makes a formation of a beginning of a beach, so to speak, with the chemistry and the water temperature, there is, um, it's, not, it's not a common rock for down here in Broward County. It, it is known to be from Jacksonville down to maybe a part of North Palm Beach County. But typically, the most prevalent area is Brevard County. So think about that. If my house was made of coquina, how much is it going to cost me to, get the, to, get the, to mine that rock and to get it down here, and so on. So that's another thought. All right, so here, olytic limestone. This is a close-up. And this, is, this cross-section was taken directly from the Butler house. And you can see it has the pitting and, or pock marks, whatever you want to call it. And it's part, it makes up part of the Atlantic Coastal Ridge. Now, what's interesting about that is this is what our strata is. This is what's underneath us right here, right under our feet. Most people say oh, we're standing on coral rock. We're not. We're standing on olytic limestone. And the pitting is caused by when it rains, the rain picks up the CO2 in the air and creates a diluted carbonic acid. And when it drops onto the limestone rock, it, it uh, eats away at the calcium carbonate that's in the um, limestone rock. And that's what causes the pitting. That's why we have sinkholes, for the same reason. The rainwater comes down, picks up the CO2, it, comes, it eventually becomes our groundwater. So the water is in there, underneath the ground. And while it's there, it's getting a meal. It's eating away mm -hmm. you know, at the calcium carbonate. And then the, when the structure becomes weak, or if the water table drops or whatever, then we have our sinkholes. It drops. That opens it up. So the chances are of it being a lytic limestone is very real versus being a coral rock or coquina. So let's take a look at some places. Venetian Pool in Coral Gables. That is an abandoned quarry that now it's a beautiful recreational pool. My, my children, we live there, so my children went, had swimming lessons there. But that building is made of olytic limestone. As is, and this is a, a cave which is directly opposite the building over here. And you're looking, the perspective is in your cave here, and you're looking right over to the building. So, and this is on the National Register of Historic Places. And, of course, Villa Vizcaya. This is a national landmark. Do you know the difference between a national landmark and a, something on the National Register? Are you interested? Yes. Yeah, OK. Yes. The difference is, when you put something on the National Register, it could have just local significance but it meets national criteria. It could have state significance or regional significance or maybe some national significance, but something on the landmark, first of all, it has to first 
be placed on the National Register, but then it has to go one step further. It has to have really national significance, like who lived there in Villa Vizcaya was well known, the owner there was an international harvester and so on. Also, the, um, you know, who lived there, stayed there, who came there, and, and, and just the architecture itself is awesome. So it meets more than just being a national on the National <coughs> Register. So that's uh, what we have here. And it's built mainly, mainly of olytic limestone. And this is the, the swimming pool underneath the building. If you've ever been there, you'll, you'll go see it. So as you can see, if you can show me where there's some coral rock, coral in there, then I would be the first one to call it a coral rock house. But I couldn't find any. I, all I found was the pitting. Okay, so this is just a picture really to show you the abandoned quarry. It's called the Topikichi Yungi or T.Y. Park. I'm going to stick to T.Y. <laughs> anyway, good, good for you, Sue. See, sometimes she's not my friend. Okay. Now <laughs> No, that's great because I, I stumble over it every time I try to say it. Anyway, it's a 146-acre recreational water park that was originally an abandoned quarry of olytic limestone. This is give you an example of the water that's filled up this beautiful recreational lake and the play area, the swim area, and whatever. And see where it's located? Here's Mr. Butler's house. Right here, here's that, what do you see, that um, historic tree island. And there is the park, right here. It was on his land, part of his 300 acres. And he used to, remember he sold coral rock to people? Well, he got it from there. And it was uh, the olytic limestone. So, uh, but he, you know, it worked for him. And so that's its co-location now. And, and it makes sense. That's where he got his rock to encase his house and to build new structure. I mean, why would he go and pay big money for wherever to buy coral rock to, if he had that right in his own backyard, which he did? And then uh, Young, Joseph Young, he used that quarry to make his miles and miles of sidewalks and roads and <coughs> all the concrete buildings we see today is made of the limestone that comes from underneath our strata, our substrata right here. And it's all basically olytic limestone. <coughs> is, that so, where the, is that where the stucco came from for all these older homes? The stucco? The, the 20s, 30s, 40s. And all the concrete elements, concrete. yeah, yeah. There's actually, isn't there a concrete factory right behind that local park? Sure. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Behind the uh, trailer park. No. So here's uh, just talk about we were talking about this is a I brought a masonry vernacular broad uh, craftsman bundeloid style and just to bring out some of the features it has the classical gable uh, ch exterior chimney <coughs> this is the gable and you have the exterior chimney and you have the deep set uh, sunken windows and you have the heavy seal sills, and, uh, and of course now you have the you know now it's encased with the um, stone, which doesn't have to be part of the it's not part of the bungalow. This is just an added feature in this particular house. So uh, and you're looking east. This is the west facade, as you can see that. So this one. And again, uh, you're looking at the east facade and north for the partial uh, north facade. Again, um, you see the olive limestone. This is a window there that's really neat. It's one of the original windows. It's a multi-pane casement style. And it's just on the on the one side of the um, uh, of the front door today. So. You said the casement casement. Yeah, it is. Uh -huh. And. So, it's, um, as I said, he doubled the size of the wind, and there, here you see 
This is the southeast, excuse me, southwest facade. And you can see the uh, chimney that stands out. You can also see, see, this is the entrance there that was at one time the main entrance. You go up the stairs, and then you would go uh, into the main entrance, was, is right along that wall inside. But when he expanded it, he enclosed that, because you would go up into a screen end porch and then go in the main door. But he you know, flipped it, and now it's, uh, he encased the, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an enclosed room now. It's an extra room. So. And this is the south facade, which is now, that's the enclosed porch area with the awning type windows. Now we're inside. The quality of this picture is, my, is very poor. I, I took them and I'm sorry, but it's the best I could do. It was one day run. And, um, but you can see it has, uh, the, um, has the interior floors and wood floors that could very well be Dade County floors. It has door, uh, wood recessed two panel doors here. Uh, that are very traditional for that. And then he has, the, they have the beadboard, which is part of the ceiling and part of the wall in certain rooms. And this was a traditional casual aesthetic treatment uh, of, that, of that time. And then it has several segmental arch, arches throughout, right here, throughout the, uh, throughout the house. But not all of them are segmental. And then this is the living room, which the uh, masonry relief mantle fireplace So what, we, uh, what is interesting is this little area has morphed from you know, just farmland to a farm and Okemo trailer park. And now it's going to morph into, and is already, part of the Sheraton Station Side Village, which is the Florida's first transit-oriented development. So that's pretty cool, actually. And, and there's. Ben is Ben's house, still there. But you can see all those farmlands that you saw, look, look what's there now. Yeah, there's a few fields left. And then we have I-95, and there's the CSX, and so on. And this is basically the Sheraton Station side village. It's a mix, mixed-use development up here. And this is the Charles Volman Park that was dedicated this past year in, in uh, honor of Mr. Charles Volman, who had a very interesting history. He was for initially in the CIA, and then he went into merchandising, and then he went into, and he's very civic-minded, and he's really contributed a great deal to Hollywood, so he was, uh, it was dedicated to him. And it's a uh, passive park there, and there's the Butler House. And this is the dedication of the, of the park. Uh, this just give you a little bit picture, better picture of the park. It's a passive park, and shows the Butler House in co-location to the development and, and the park itself. And so this is the Butler House, but there's a little bit more I want to share with you. Um, Butler, uh, he had a son. He had three children, uh, three daughters, and one son. And this is Ben, uh, his son, which is the great grandson. And uh, they moved, they have farms in Okeechobee, Lurita area. And this is their massive farm. It's 1,700 acres or something, and it's dairy cows and Jersey milking cows is what they have. Is that, that's a mite big <laughs> farm. Wow. And there, a few years ago, that's uh, the great-grandson, Ben, who came down to see the Butler House and other things, what I'll get to. But before I get there, I want to show the areas of significance of the Butler House according to the designation report. It, uh, it has integrity of location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, and association with, say, Mr. Young. And the embodiment of distinctive characteristic type period, method of construction, and possession of high artistic value, which is the encasement and the wood st uh, rock structure, and has si significant contributions to the broad patterns of our history. And you can see how it's more from one to the other to the other, and it's still out there and still contributing. But I had the opportunity to talk to Mildred uh, Butler. 
Now, Mildred was married to Robert, who was the son of Ben. And she said, we called him Daddy Ben. That was his name, Daddy Ben. And his wife was named Queenie. And as he said, he brought, got most of his land through tax certificates, just like Mr. Young did. And his land that he had, was, she said, was mostly tomato farm or raw land. So she said it took him about three years to get the land in you know, shape to, for his cows. And, um, and then they sold the farm in 1965. Now, at a certain point, up to a certain point, I thought that Ben went to Okeechobee. No, he didn't. He stayed. Queen um, Mildred and her husband Robert, who's his son, they lived on Park Street. So what happened was they sold the farm, and then they took the cows, Mildred and Robert took the cows and went to Okeechobee. Ben and Queenie moved in to Mildred and Robert's house on Park Street, where they lived for about five years until he passed. Hmm? Park Road. Thank you. He said Park Road, and I think he's right. He's right. I remember I had that, ran into that. Yeah. Park Road. And so, um, what the, she, she, it was a cool story, actually. She said, what we did was we take so many cows. I guess how many could stand, uh, be carried on a one truck? And they would milk them, okay? And then to put the cows on the truck, and, and the family and the worker, worker with, the, with that group of cows. And off they went to Okeechobee. And then they did a, another group of cows, did the same thing. Now, I said, well, how many did you have? I said, was it 50, 100, 200? Well, it was a lot. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> so off they went. So the next time those cows were milked, it was, they were Okeechobee residents. <laughs> so. And then she said, um, when they moved up there, they had a house built in Okeechobee on 24th Street. And when the movers brought their furniture to move into the house, she, Mildred says, I went that, the, the sofa to go here, the bed go that way on that wall. And, you know, she was very specific. And the owner says, or the mover says, how, how do you know? You just bought this house. She says, well, we built it in the same plan as the one in Hollywood. <laughs> so she knew exactly. <laughs> knew exactly where she wanted it. And then, a few years ago, I think that picture you saw Ben next to the house. A few years ago, Ben's uh, great, great grandsons and family, whoever, they all came down to Hollywood. They wanted to see where their father lived, the, the Butler house and the one on Park Road, as he put it, which is correct. And uh, he wasn't, nobody was home, so they left a card. And uh, when, uh, later, the owner of the house called the Butler family and said, you know, got the card, blah, 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 and they started talking. And they had just come back come from a trip to Europe. And when, if you've been to Europe, you know that every house or building or of any worth has um, a name. You know, it's called this chateau or Meisner, whatever. And so they wanted to have a name for their house. So when the conversation was all said and done, they called their house on Park Road, the Butler Oaks. <laughs> so, so now it's your, it's your job to go to, Butler, uh, to Park Road and find Butler Oaks. Yeah, so. Anyway, Mildred uh, lives in Okeechobee, the same house. She's 87 years old, and that's where she was. That's in, Bo no, no, uh, that's in, uh, yeah, Okeechobee. Yeah, you need to find the park road curves and go straight to the Yeah. It's elevated. Yeah, it's elevated. Blue. Is it where the Well, they already know where it is. So, did you find a sign? Okay, that's one mystery. We already solved it. Now we call uh, 
Park Road, which is correct, and uh, the Butler Oaks you're going to find, or you know where it is. And the other thing, did it was it from Garfield Street or was it from yeah, Cleveland? That would be hard. That. Question on the interior of the house. I assume it's lath and plaster. But see, I have no air conditioning. What is the future of the house? I'm sure it's going to. They have. Rock, if another rock, you need central air and other. Place. They have AC units. I know. I have some yeah. AC. One second out of all that. Uh, you have to ask your local people that. I, I was a consultant. I don't live here. I don't. Yeah, there's so. no uh, monetary maintenance as far as checking. The I do know this. The X developer X gave X amount of dollars to the city to to revamp the house to you know bring it up to whatever. So that's I know they have that kind of money, but I don't know how much they all need, and they obviously could pick your rents. So it's always telling you that just uh, open to the It's the county. Know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not or the Hollywood. Is it Hollywood? Yeah, it's Hollywood. It's not open to the public. Go ahead. I was just going to comment on rock pits in Hollywood. The first rock pit is, became more or less the city dump. It's on the south side of the boulevard out in the west. Okay. So that was where Young started excavating for his sidewalk. Yeah, that makes sense. But then when they started digging the two lakes, north and south lake, they quickly discovered that they were only about this <laughs> this much water and they went right into rock. Get it? Yeah. So they were throwing up rock around the lake and I think that was probably free for the taking. Sure, it was. Because we, sure. we had more than that one rock. Where yeah, yeah, I know. They're all over the place. Yeah. yeah. So where was the first and how far west were you going to um, <coughs> It's in Panic and there are a lot of pictures of it. We have lots of pictures of the first rock. There's a steam shovel going yeah, okay. away. Um, I would say it's in the um, 20s, 20th, <coughs> but it's on the south side. Okay. Way out west there, right? Yeah, it, I'm yeah. not sure. <laughs> right, yes, yeah, because he hadn't developed any further. Yeah. <laughs> so that there were other <laughs> No, there are war there's quarries all over the place. That's true, and it's all, you know, and it's very prevalent here in Broward County and in Dade County. So. My mommy told me it's a way that's really with the rock. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's what we call it. Yeah. Well, everybody's information, the Millman Construction Company made a deal with the city of Hollywood to, uh, I think it was North Lake or South Lake, to dig it out for yeah. the marina and everything, yeah. and all the fell went over to the Harbor Island development oh, did it? for free and it brought it up to eight foot elevation, which is the highest elevation that I know in Hollywood. Yes, that's South Lake. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. That's 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 right. Allendale area where all the shopping malls are. M I L. Yeah. Melman. Yeah. Melman. Yeah. Melman. Yeah. Melman. Melman. Yeah. Melman. When did they When did they pick up the lakes? Oh, that lake was in the sixties. In the sixties or seventies. I know there was a big uh, dispute on the development plan for Harper Island that I read in some of uh, I have a lot of standards. Uh, with the court injunction and the uh, court uh, proceedings and uh, all that stuff is on record and how uh, they're going to develop it. Uh, mm -hmm on the site plan. But anyway, they, part of the deal was to dig out that lake and bring up the elevation. And I remember standing on Washington Street 25, 30 years ago with my father. Every house on Washington Street was for sale, but they didn't know what they were going to do with that fill. Everybody thought they were going to build another hotel or whatever there, and it was very secretive. So uh, anyway, uh, it was uh, one of those long-lasting developments that went from the 70s until it was occupancies in the 90s. Mm. Oh, right. Oh, sure. We They informed us that North Lake and South Lake was, was dug out by the Army Engineer Corps during uh, the Roosevelt area. And, and it also stopped, the, um, it helped Joseph Young because he had all, oh. he built the hotel on the right. island, right. but this way it, it would stop the flooding when there was a um, high tides and stuff right. in the Army Engineer Corps. If, okay. I mean, correct me. I don't it's, know about the Army Engineer Corps, Corps the built, cut, uh, when did well, the, the use was, the was that part of the, the Are you talking about part of the intercoastal? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, they were, uh, they were given. Yeah. They were digging the north and south. And Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, was a strong plant and stuff, and they wanted to develop it. talking about the lake. Yeah. But that would be, um, if it's Roosevelt, it's in the 30s. 
Yeah. That would be the next company that came in to develop Hollywood. Well, Hollywood Inc. Hollywood Inc. Hollywood Inc. Hollywood Inc. Well, but anyway, it was all swamp land. He wanted to develop. That was all for what I remember yeah. reading. Well, the intercoastal but you can correct me. Yeah, the waterway was really, really created through existing lakes, rivers, <coughs> wetlands, and but whatever, the and the Army Corps of Engineers. They weren't the original ones that but dig it out, but they deeper. they became the regular, you know, the regular. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
local register does stop. It's a national register that is very. However, if you city on property, well, guess what? Mm -hmm. So you were instrumental in getting it on the. City of yeah, I did the designation. Exactly. Yeah, I was hired by the city. There's another defect in these limestone uh, houses that I've come across and it's been documented. The old flower and power light uh, plant used coal uh, until uh, 1940 or mm -hmm. even 50, and they used the, they couldn't get rid of fly ash. So all that cinder ash mm -hmm. was given to the concrete company and they mixed the uh, yeah. The acid, acid, it was an acidy cinder, oh. and it went into the concrete oh. mix, and it looked fine for four or five years until the moisture got into the concrete blocks, and it created an acidy uh, chemical reaction, and that's why you'll find a lot of these old uh, limestone uh, blocks or even foundations with cracks because of the cinder concrete. represented the Butler VW in Queens. And um, they, and I just wanted people to know that when they sold their farm land, that's what became Hollywood Hills because Hollywood Incorporated bought all of that land and that's where Hollywood Hills began and Emerald Hills and all that area. And it was quite a lawsuit. I was right out of high really? school and I'm like, oh my God, they did quiet titles of all the tax deeds in order to get all the property mm -hmm. in his name so that he could sell it off to Hollywood Incorporated to build Hollywood mm -hmm. Hills. So when, when was that about? That was in, mm -hmm. you're asking when I graduated? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 61. Yeah, 1961. Always have to ask those questions. <laughs> Yeah, you did. Because I grew up with all yeah. those dairies. I it was amazing. Up. I read that. Yeah. yeah. So if anybody's interested, and then other parts of all this history, call us and then probably have something on it. Yeah, they had some great, you know, it can kind of fill in the little gaps or the things that, and it gives you a, a good sense of your history. And, and well, I, mean, I, read, I read a statistic, this was when I lived at Fort Lauderdale, uh, historical, that uh, uh, Broward in the 50s was the second largest dairy state. Gary County in the state. I believe it. Largest in the U.S. Oh, wow. And now Fondy Cow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but in 1900, the pioneers, the real, real, real pioneers, didn't believe livestock would survive here at all. So it took right. Ham Foreman and crazy people like that to introduce uh, cows and cattle to Davy and places like that as we conquered the mosquito problem out the road. And the and the and all the things that go back. Uh, but anyway, fascinating, isn't it? And that's 50 years, 50 years, totally changed. I, I wanted to just piggyback on what Karen said about Hollywood, Inc. Um, when my mother and father came to Hollywood in uh, really the late 50s, uh, way before I was born, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> palmetto bugs and palm trees and all of that. And I remember my father and mother buying the land where our funeral home still remains, right there across from military, what was military academy circle. Um, and he, they purchased that land in 57, the original part. And I remember him, you know, much later as a child saying, how expensive that land was, and Hollywood Inc. never, you know, he would say just, you know, things, you know. Um, and I, I'm not, you know, there's no fault. It's just very interesting that certainly it was the time to buy land, as it always is. And he bought what he could afford, because, you know, I'm born to the greatest generation in doing what he needed to do. He bought only what he could afford, and then he kept Adam. So now he owns, you know, we own all of that land, but it was in little bits and pieces from Hollywood Inc. Um, way back. And they didn't open the funeral home until 1962. So it took, you know, 
a few years to buy the land and then to build and then uh, to open up. And um, this is very personal and kind of it's making me smile. My father is sitting right now in his car watching a new parking lot going in because he's all about the land all of these years later. It's absolutely adorable. He is watching that he is building an additional parking lot behind our land park female home to the side for more beautiful lighted parking. He is so about the land and the beauty of Hollywood Hills. And now how, how old is your dad? Anna? My dad is 88 years old. Uh -huh. And I think he has a hard hat somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's very cool. It makes me really um, proud um, you know, to come to me. And I like to listen to you talk about it. Yeah, that's really sweet. That's really sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this was awesome. All the contributions today, right? Ken? That's Any the best time? part about <laughs> like this. When you know. people that yeah. 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 Any other questions or any comments? Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay.